All right, in this video, we're gonna first gonna review the concepts of local and absolute extrema. Then we're gonna get into the conversation of using differentiation to identify them. First and foremost up here, I've placed the definitions, loose definitions of local max and local mins and absolute max and absolute mins. When we're starting here, it's important to know that C, the value being here, is a value in the domain as I put up here. But first of all, for local max and local min values, F of C, so the output at the X value of C, is called the local max. If that value, that output value, is bigger than every other output value near that C value, F of C, we say, is a local min if it's less than all the other values near that value. The output at x equals c is called an absolute max if it's greater than or equal to every other output value for any x value on the domain. And it's called the local min if the output is less than or equal to any other output value on the domain. All right, before we move forward and get into the calculus with this stuff, let's look at a graphical representation to remind us what local min, local maxes, and absolute min and maxes are all about. We have a fourth degree polynomial here. And what you'll see is I've labeled these points at x equals negative three, x equals zero, and x equals five. At x equals negative three and x equals five, we say that those output values there are local min values. At x equals zero, we call that output of zero a local max. And then for this function, that output at x equals five, that value of a negative 11.5, we would call that an absolute min value for this function. That is the smallest value output by this function. And it's important to note that this function actually would not have an absolute maximum value. All right, now let's get some calculus into the conversation. This is a really important theorem called Fermat's theorem. This states that if f has a local min or local max at some x value called c in this case, and the derivative exists, then the derivative must be equal to zero. If you think about it from that last picture and what we've seen before, that makes sense, right? If the derivative equals zero at some x value, it means it has a horizontal tangent. That's where you get these peaks and valleys, graphically speaking. Really important, we've talked about this previously, the logic of this does not say that if the derivative is equal to zero, then it is a local max or min. In a couple of seconds, we'll see examples of that. And now a little bit of terminology that links up directly to the Fermat's theorem here is the idea of a critical number or a critical point. We call C a critical number if the derivative at C is equal to zero or if the derivative does not exist. These critical numbers are the values that we're going to use to find local and absolute max and min values. Now importantly, as you think back to this, if we find where the derivative is equal to zero or where it does not exist, that does not mean it will be a local max or min, but if this function does have a local max or min, then we know that the and the derivative exists, we know it must be zero. We're checking the places it does not exist for other things that could happen where we could have local and absolute max and mins. So again, just some quick graphical representations of these concepts right here. If we look at f of x equals x squared, f prime of zero is zero. So x equals zero is a critical number. Um, and it's also the absolute, it's a local min and the absolute min for this function. Now for x cubed, the derivative at x equals zero is equal to zero for x cubed, right? Because x cubed, the derivative would be three x squared. You plug in a zero, you're gonna get out of zero. But in this, so in this case, we would say x equals zero is a critical number, but as you can see, it's neither a local min nor a local max, and therefore it cannot be an absolute or a max or minimum. And now for the absolute value of x, if we look at what's happening at x equals zero, this function is actually not differentiable. It's one of these points, right? It's not the same slope coming from the left and the right. So at x equals zero, it's not differentiable, meaning x equals zero is a critical number for this function, um, but it's not differentiable, though at x equals zero, we do have an absolute minimum value. Again, the point being this. These ideas of critical numbers are where we're gonna look for local and absolute min and max values. Though if a, if a value is a critical number, it does not mean that a local, man, a local min max or an absolute min or max occurs at that value. 
All right, now for two quick examples of just finding critical numbers. In this case right here, we have f of x equals x cubed plus 6x squared minus 15x. We're being asked to find all critical numbers. What we're going to do is find the first derivative, and then we're going to identify where the first derivative is equal to 0 or where it does not exist. It's pretty straightforward to differentiate this. All we need is the power rule. This becomes 3x squared plus 12x minus 15. Um, if I didn't set this equal to zero, what I'm going to do actually first is to factor out a factor of three to make my life a little bit easier. So I get x squared plus 4x minus five. And then I'm just gonna solve this by factoring this to get three times um, x plus five times x minus one. Again, I've set this derivative equal to zero because I'm trying to find out when the derivative is equal to zero. In this case, uh, I'll get using the zero factor property at x equals negative five and x equals one. Those are my only two critical numbers because this as a polynomial, it does not have any x values for which it does not exist. All right, in the second example, we have a rational function here. I will differentiate this using the quotient rule. So h prime of x is uh, gonna be, x squared, so the derivative x squared is 2x times the bottom here is negative 2 squared, uh, minus the derivative of the denominator here, which is a 2x minus 2 to the 1 power. I would then multiply by the derivative of the inside stuff here, but it's actually just 1, so I'm not going to write it there. But then times x squared all over this denominator squared, which would end up giving me x minus 2 to the fourth power, and it's to the fourth power, right? Because when I square this, I multiply that square by this square here to get to the fourth. Now I've taken the derivative, I'm gonna simplify this. One thing that I'm gonna to do to make my life a little bit easier is I see these factors of x minus two on both terms in the numerator, and then I obviously have a bunch of them down here. I'm gonna cancel one factor of the x minus two from each term of the numerator with this down in the denominator just to make my, knife, my life a little bit nicer. Uh, when I do this, and then I'm gonna get 2x times one of these x minus twos, so that's gonna be 2x squared minus 4x. Over here, all I'm left with is just the two times x squared, so minus 2x squared all over x minus two to the third power. Finally, these x, these 2x squareds cancel themselves out, and I'm left with just negative 4x over x minus 2 cubed. All right, and now to identify the critical numbers, I'm looking for what makes this derivative function equal to zero, or what makes it undefined, or what makes it not exist. Those two questions are what x value makes the numerator zero that will make the derivative zero. In this case, it's pretty straightforward. It's just x equals zero. And then for values for which this derivative doesn't exist, well, that's when the denominator would be equal to zero. So in this case, two would be a critical number because the derivative does not exist at x equals two.